Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special webinar on the Western Drought. My name is Viva Deheza, and I am the Executive Director of NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System, or as we're mostly known as NIDIS. Um, uh, next slide, please. Before we get started, um, I wanted to uh, cover some housekeeping items with the group. On this webinar, everyone is muted, and the webinar is being recorded. The webinar recording will be available on the NIDIS YouTube channel and linked from the webinars page at drought.gov backslash webinars. We do have time on the agenda at the end to take a few of your questions. And for questions, we're asking you to please use the question box, which is located within the GoToWebinar control panel. And to please include in asking your question, your name and your affiliation. This is the third of this type of Westwide drought webinar. And NIDIS has hosted over the recent two to three years of drought, these webinars. The purpose of these is, is as, as in the past, is to provide the most up-to-date information on drought conditions and the outlooks. This year, we're coming more so during drought recovery rather than drought development or worsening conditions, which is obviously a very welcome change for all of us. Only approximately 25% of the West remains in drought compared to approximately 74% at the start of the water year in October. However, we recognize this year's conditions are not without caveats, such as not all states received above normal precipitation, some received too much precipitation and are suffering from severe flooding and long-term drought remains. It will take more than one wet winter, albeit a, a very wet winter, even with record-breaking precipitation to replenish the groundwater in many areas, as well as Lakes Powell and Mead, which are still near record low levels. Before we get started, let me introduce NIDIS for those who are not familiar with our program. NIDIS was established by Congress in 2006 by public law and was congressionally reauthorized twice with strong bipartisan support in 2014 and in 2019. We are charged with developing and providing a national drought early warning system to enable the nation to move from a reactive posture to drought to a more proactive approach to managing drought risks and impacts. And our public law authorizes NIDIS to engage in partnerships with federal, state, tribal, local partners, as well as the private sector, academic partners, and the citizen scientists. And I want to expand a little bit more on this idea of partnership. And I've circled it here to kind of illuminate this for you all. NIDIS fulfills its mission for partnership, not only in consultation with partners, but also in communication coordination of early warning and drought status information, such as these webinars, like this one, and drought status updates, which we'll be producing following this webinar. The contribution of our partners, including the state climate offices and water and natural resource agencies, is integral to understanding the nuances of drought and its impacts within the states and to ensure early warning and updated information gets into the hands of those impacted on the ground. The first half of our webinar today will be the, uh, will be the Western drought conditions and outlook provided by Joe Casola, who's with NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information. He is a Regional Climate Services Director. And also providing drought conditions in the outlook will be Dave DeWitt, who is the Director of NOAA's The Weather Services Climate Prediction Center. Subsequent speakers will then cover related updates on groundwater from USGS, the Colorado River Basin from the National Weather Service's Colorado Basin River Forecast Center, and context of the long-term drought from NOAA's Physical Sciences Laboratory. The last 20 to 30 minutes will be a Q&A. Again, please put all your questions in the GoToWebinar questions box. So without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce our first presenter. First up is Joe Casola speaking on the Western Drought Conditions Update. Joe is a Western, the Western Regional Climate Services Director with NOAA's NCEI. As, as a Regional Climate Services Director for the Western Region, Joe seeks to understand how decision makers are using climate information and how NOAA can best address the growing needs for climate data and services. 
Dr. Kosola earned his PhD and master's degrees in atmospheric sciences from the University of Washington, where his research examined the response of snowpack in the Cascades to rising temperatures. Obviously a topic that is very relevant today. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you, Joe. Great, thanks, Viva. Here are the key points that I'd like to discuss uh, as part of the drought condition update. <clears throat> First, there's been substantial improvement in drought conditions across most of the West. Second, these improvements were a consequence of above average precipitation, colder than average temperature, and abundant snowpack. Third, drought, there are smaller areas of drought that still remain, uh, and we'll see some maps of this, and, and some of those locations include parts of the Pacific Northwest, Central Utah, Southern Nevada, and Eastern Colorado and Eastern New Mexico. And lastly, as Viva mentioned, reservoir le levels in the Colorado River Basin in particular, uh, Lake Mead and Lake Powell uh, are quite low and they continue to reflect multi-year deficits in precipitation. Next slide, please. So before we jump into the current conditions, I wanted to take us back to the beginning of the water year, so the end of September in 2022. And this is what the drought monitor map looked like then. You can see that uh, most of the West was in some stage of drought with extreme and exceptional drought occurring over large parts of California, Oregon, Nevada, and Utah. And that's shown by those, those dark red colors. Uh, now, let's see where we are now, kind of comparison. So next slide, please. You can immediate, and this is the drought monitor map from last week. So you can see the substantial improvement where we've had uh, the removal of a lot of those hot colors as drought has improved in, in many, many locations. And next slide, please. We can actually dive in and, and look at some of the numbers uh, that quantify this, this improvement. At the beginning of the water year and the, the numbers associated with the, that, that first map, the beginning of the water year are shown uh, in that fourth, fourth uh, row. Um, most of the West, over 96%, had some sort of drought uh, category, even if it was from ab anywhere between abnormally dry all the way to exceptional drought. And as part of that, almost 20% of the Western area was in that extreme to exceptional drought, so one of the shades of red. Uh, now we have only about half of the West in, in some, uh, some stage of drought, and most of that is either just the D0 of normally dry or D1 moderate drought. That extreme to uh, exceptional drought uh, only covers a little over 1% of the current land area. So you can see that, that we've had really substantial uh, lessening of, of the drought conditions that we started off with at the beginning of the water year. Uh, at the state level, you can see that, that oh, not quite yet, Adam. Um, at the state level, you can see that, that some of the biggest changes have been in California, where we went from large swaths of extreme and exceptional drought to, to no classification of drought. Um, it is also important to, to note that drought conditions do persist in some subregions or some local pockets. Uh, you can see the uh, red blotch in kind of central and western, uh, central and eastern Oregon, pardon me. Uh, you can see in kind of northern Idaho and western Montana, still some uh, severe drought, as well as central Utah, southern Nevada, and the eastern portions of Colorado and New Mexico. Next slide, please. So the reason for a lot of this improvement is pretty straightforward. We've had a, a relatively wet and cold uh, seven months since the beginning of the water year. So at the left is a map of the precipitation by percentile for that October to April period. And uh, at the right is uh, for temperatures by percentile as well. And the colors, which if, if you can't see quite see the color bar, uh, the, the darkest color, uh, let's say in the green, would be the, the wettest year on record. Uh, the lightest green would be in the top third and then the in-between color of green is, is in the top 10%. So you can see that, that big areas of California, Utah, uh, Nevada, even into Southern Idaho and, uh, and parts of the desert Southwest are, are in the green with a few uh, areas of kind of record precipitation 
uh, that are that are kind of um, immersed within those those big areas. In addition, you can see some. Um, uh, if you look at kind of the, um, the temperature picture, um, amazingly, kind of cold conditions across the West. And I think this is in some ways even more striking than the precipitation uh, uh, map in the sense that with climate warming, you know, the odds for such a long uh, lived anomaly of cold over a long Air, uh, over a large area like the West, uh, the odds for that just kind of go down and down. So it's this is kind of a, a very surprising and kind of anomalous situation. Um, I do also want to acknowledge that that we shouldn't take too celebratory a note, and I think Viva mentioned this in the beginning, about having lots and lots of rain. What, while it does lessen drought conditions, when it arrives in, uh, in very short periods of time, um, there can be devastating consequences. In California in particular, uh, you know, we saw communities displaced, we saw loss of life, we saw damage to some serious infrastructure. So even though I think this improvement in drought conditions is important, uh, I think we, we have to also acknowledge that there, there were costs and there, were, were, um, there was significant damage associated with some of it. Uh, next slide, please. I want to also call out a couple of areas where the uh, Kind of bumper crop of rainfall didn't really occur. And in the Northwest, you can see uh, some areas uh, of relatively dry conditions, as well as in Eastern Colorado and Eastern New Mexico. And I think as we start to think about what might happen in the coming months, it's important to keep in mind that, that those locations didn't get quite the rainfall that we observed in places like, like California, the Sierras, and, and in parts of the Rockies. Next slide, please. So when we have relatively cold and wet conditions, that, that sets up a really great situation for snowpack. So this, uh, this map shows what the April 1st, uh, the water held in the snowpack on April 1st. And we often uh, call that snow water equivalent or SWE is sometimes the acronym you hear. Uh, so this shows the, the snow water equivalent uh, on that date, which is conventionally taken as being close to when peak snowpack Occurs, not always right on April 1st, but sometime around then. And you can see there's a lot of blue and green shading on the map, and that indicates above average or above median in this case, snowpack relative to a recent 30 year period. And you can see in the numbers that are written into these uh, various watersheds, that's the actual percentage relative to that, to that historic. In. And so sometimes you've seen two and three times the amount of water uh, that would be kind of that median value in the past in places across uh, the Sierras uh, through Nevada, Utah, and northern Arizona. You also see pretty good conditions uh, into the, the Rockies in Colorado, uh, as well as uh, southern Idaho and, and parts of, of Oregon. As you get farther north into Washington and northern Idaho and, and Montana, the um, Snowpack was still close to the 30-year median value, but, but not quite as, as abundant as some of the places that are farther south. Next slide, please. And this is just a comparison of what the snowpack looked like in April 2022. So it's a dramatic difference for, uh, for our snow accumulation. And we've had actually so much snow uh, in in during this winter that, that a lot of the snow is actually holding on, uh, partly aided by the fact that we had a big dump of snow, as well as that even April, March and April have been relatively cool, so the snow melt has not uh, been at a, at a super fast pace. Next slide, please. So now we can look at kind of where water is. You know, we looked at that kind of rainfall, temperature, snowpack. Now we can look at, at various metrics of, of where the water is, is currently. And, and one thing we can look at is stream flow. And this is just instantaneous stream flow from various stream gauges around the country from USGS. Uh, and you can see this kind of a abundance of green and blue and a few kind of black dots. And, and those all indicate either normal or above normal stream flow for this time of year. Next slide, please. Another metric for kind of where the water is, is to look at soil moisture. And this is from the NASA Sport uh, product, and it's an estimate of, of soil moisture in the, the top 
hundred centimeters, so the top several feet. Uh, so that usually gets down to kind of the root zone. Um, and you can see a lot of blue and green colors indicating relatively high soil moisture based on the percentiles. Uh, again, showing kind of the consequence of having a uh, very wet and, and snowy uh, and cold winter. Next slide, please. Uh, another way to think about kind of where the water is, is to think about reservoir levels. And this is a, a kind of smattering of three different uh, depictions of, of reservoir levels. The one at the left is a combination of the reservoir storage for the whole state of California, taken from the Water Watch webpage. And uh, that shows that, that across all those reservoirs, it's uh, just over 100% of their average, which is substan a substantial improvement from where the state has been in the last few years. The two maps to, to kind of in the middle and the right, those are both of the Colorado River Basin. Uh, at the right is the upper basin, so you can see Colorado, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, the four corner states, as well as the lower basin in the middle. And um, each of those little teacup pictures represents a single reservoir. And so you can see that in the Colorado system, many of the reservoirs, especially in the upper basin, are uh, close to their capacity or, or doing pretty well. Uh, but if you can hit the next slide, there are two exceptions, and that's Lake Powell and Lake Mead, which are the biggest reservoirs. Uh, Lake Powell kind of synthesizes or kind of is the gate between the upper basin and lower basin, and Lake Mead is just below that. Uh, currently, they are still quite low, although the forecasts, and Paul will show them, I think, a little bit later, uh, call for them to increase their level. They are still reflecting uh, multiple years of, of dry conditions, as well as, I would actually argue, multiple decades where a lot of the, the uh, amount of water in the river was, was below what, what we have kind of portioned to users. Next slide, please. I want to also zoom into one area where, where um, drought does persist, and this is in Oregon. Um, and this is from the, the State Water Resources Department that uh, has put together some of the uh, kind of the status of its various reservoirs. And you can see um, uh, that I've put a box around in red, some of the reservoirs that are, are below where their, their average level is. And many of these are in that kind of eastern or central to eastern Oregon area, the, the, the same areas where we still see uh, popping up on the drought monitor. And so I think uh, drought concerns persist in, in certainly in this part of the Pacific Northwest. Next slide, and this will be my last one. So just to return to kind of the, the key points, there's been substantial improvement in drought conditions across most of the West. Those improvements were a uh, consequence of above average precipitation, uh, colder than average temperatures and abundant snowpack. There's still small areas of drought remaining, and we've shown those in the, the drought monitor maps. And the reservoir levels specifically in Lake Mead and Lake Powell continue to reflect multi-year deficits in precipitation. We would need several uh, very wet years to, to recover those levels. Sorry, I forgot to turn my mic back on. <laughs> Thanks, Joe, so much for the update. Okay, next up, we're going to hear from David DeWitt um, with the Drought and Climate Outlook. And Dave is the director of NOAA's National Weather Service Climate Prediction Center. Uh, Dave joined the National Weather Service back in 2012 as the lead modeler within the Science Plans branch of the Office of Science and Technology. And prior to coming to NOAA, Dave worked as a research scientist at the International Research Institute and uh, for Climate and Society, IRI, at Columbia University. And he has served a detail as the acting deputy director for NSEP, uh, Environmental Modeling Center. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dave. Great. Thanks a lot, Viva. Uh, great pleasure to be here to speak with you today and talk about the uh, forecast for the upcoming season. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about the major mode of climate variability that's going to be impacting us over the next six to nine months. Uh, not going to talk about current drought conditions because Joe actually already did that. Um, I'll give the seasonal outlook uh, for the May, June, July period for temperature, precipitation, and drought. 
For those who are interested in the uh, shorter term evolution, I'll give you the forecast for uh, day eight to 14. Uh, and then I'll, I'll summarize and give the key messages. Next slide. So with respect to Western precipitation, most of which as you're fully aware, um, falls in the winter. Um, is, uh, and a lot of it comes as snow, especially in the mountainous terrain. El Nino and La Nina is the largest um, climate forcing mechanism. And uh, we've just come out of a, a La Nina. We're now forecasting a fairly rapid transition into El Nino conditions. In fact, we're expecting that some point uh, in the next couple of months with a 60% probability we'll be in El Nino conditions. As you get into the fall and into the winter, it's a much higher probability, uh, over 80%. Uh, and I should say that the El Nino impacts on precipitation for the U.S., especially for the West, are relatively small. We would expect much larger impacts for the winter. And generally speaking, El Nino would tend to favor above normal precipitation for the southern tier uh, of the U.S., including California. And then um, it would favor below normal precipitation for the northern tier, places like Washington State. Oregon, Montana, et cetera. Uh, next slide. So again, sorry, we could skip this one. So in terms of what we're forecasting for the May, June, July period, and these forecasts are always probabilistic. They're given in tercile probabilities where this is relevant to a climatology or in reference to a climatology from 1991 to 2020. And uh, the categories are either favoring below normal, near normal, or above normal. Again, with respect to that 1991 to 2020 climatology. So what you can see with respect to the temperature, which is on the left, is we're favoring uh, above normal temperature for all of Washington State, uh, basically all of Oregon and the northern part of Idaho, uh, as well as uh, in the southern part of the western region, Texas, New Mexico, part of Arizona, getting up into Colorado, as well as sliding over uh, into Oklahoma and Kansas. With respect to precipitation, we're uh, favoring an enhanced probability of below normal precipitation up in the Northwest, including for Washington State, significant part of Idaho, and then a large part of Montana, uh, as well as uh, northwestern texas uh, and new mexico and the southeast corner of arizona next slide with respect to the shorter term outlook this is a two-week outlook for the day 8 to 14 outlook which is relevant for may 16th to the 22nd you can see we have uh when the temperature forecast is on the left we have a very high probability or really quite strong probability of favoring above normal temperature for a large part of the Northwest. Uh, although the whole West Coast has also got a significant probability of above normal temperature for this period. And that does also extend along the, the Northern tier there through Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, and down into um, even getting into uh, Nebraska. Then we are favoring uh, during this two week period, uh, enhanced probability of below normal temperature for Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, uh, and even getting into um, the, the southern part of uh, Kansas there. With respect to precipitation during this period, um, we're favoring an enhanced probability of below normal precipitation along that northern tier uh, of the western states, including the northern parts of Washington State, Idaho, Montana, and into the Dakotas as well. Uh, and then there is an enhanced probability of above normal precipitation for a significant part of the rest of the western US that's south of that, including a fairly high probability of above normal precipitation for Arizona and into Utah and the western part of New Mexico. So there is also, as you probably see there, uh, enhanced probability of above normal precipitation for California. Of course, as folks from California appreciate, it's not really your rainy season, so it's not gonna be much precipitation occurring. Um, next slide. 
So we integrate that information uh, and we use the U.S. Drought Monitor as the initial conditions to produce a forecast for what we expect for drought conditions uh, to be for the next three months. And so this is for the May to July 2023 period. Uh, and so the forecasted warm and dry conditions um, uh, that we just looked at are going to lead to drought development in eastern Washington, western Texas, eastern Kansas, and uh, northeast, north central New Mexico. We are expecting drought improvement for central Texas, northern Oklahoma, eastern Montana, western North Dakota, and western Nebraska as well. And the forecast for most of the remainder of the West is for drought persistence. Next slide. So in summary, uh, as has been shown um, by Joe, the heavy precipitation, Western snowfall this winter, ameliorated a lot of the drought conditions that had been pervasive across the Western US. Uh, we are currently predicting drought development for Eastern Washington, Western Texas, Eastern Kansas, and North Central New Mexico. Uh, predictions for uh, the upcoming fall and winter are gonna be strongly influenced by what we expect to be is the onset of El Nino conditions. Just a reminder that El Nino conditions in the winter favor enhanced probability for above normal precipitation for the southern third of the U.S. and below normal precipitation for the northern third of the U.S. Uh, predictions as to the strength of the El Nino and more precise impacts as well as updated temperature precipitation and drought outlooks will come in, in the future months. Um, thank you. Thanks so much, Dave. All right, let's keep this um, the information rolling here. Next up is gonna be John Trom with an update on groundwater. John is a hydrologist with the USGS California Water Science Center and has been a hydrologist for 19 years in both the private and government sectors. Uh, John received his master's in 2004 from UC Berkeley and he is a registered professional civil engineer in the state of California. So John, I'm gonna turn it over to you, thank you. All right, thank you for the introduction. Um, so my talk is actually going to be a little bit different than the other talks um, since I'm talking about uh, groundwater. Um, the groundwater is a little bit different than surface water because surface water during um, a drought, we can obviously see effects right away. And groundwater, um, as I'm going to talk about, um, has a little bit of a lag. So we can't always see exactly what's going on. And I also just wanted to mention that almost all of my work is in California. So kind of the focus of my talk is going to be what's going on in California. But I think Definitely what's going on in California is applicable to uh, a lot of the basins throughout the West. So we can go next slide. All right, so talking about the groundwater system a little bit, if you look at that little graph on the bottom right there, essentially in during pre-development times, most of the groundwater system was what we would, we'd call it full. And in, essentially you could uh, punch a well in an area and that water would actually free flow in a lot of places. Uh, but over the last, you know, 150 years since human development has been around, we have depleted groundwater levels estimated almost um, 850 million acre feet. So I know a lot of us, you know, might go outside and say, look at Lake Mead and see, you know, 20,000 or 20 million acre feet missing from Lake Mead and feel kind of uncomfortable from that. Imagine um, that underground groundwater basin that you can't see is actually missing over 30 times that amount of water. And the thing with the groundwater is that, um, you know, in the past we kind of treated these as separate resources, but um, all of the recent research has really shown that the two are integrated on um, a very, uh, as you can see, like during the wet period, you know, here that we, you know, we're hopefully going to be able to see that interconnection between groundwater and surface water and get some of the groundwater levels uh, recharged. The problem with the groundwater recharge, though, is that it's, ex is that it is limited because there are several factors that make it so that it's not gonna recover as quickly as the surface water supplies. And really kind of what I wanna, want you guys to think about in this talk and kind of think of the challenges, you know, how, especially with the, uh, you know, storms that are coming in, you know, related to atmospheric rivers with, you know, a lot, a lot of the rain falling in a very small period of time, how we can overcome that challenge of getting that groundwater to recharge and getting that surface water into the groundwater system. So we can go to the next slide. So I just wanted to explain, this is like the, the two minute geology lesson, but um, essentially just kind of explain what the aquifer system looks like. So if you can see, we've got the land surface there, but 
underneath you know water like i said has a lot of challenges from getting from the land surface down to the aquifer where we're pumping so you can see those pumping wells they're pumping deep and the recharge water essentially has to first of all get through uh any clay deposits on the surface so you know say that um you have a you know you're putting the water at, in, a, in a river but the river has a clay bed so it takes time for that water to seep through and then the water's in that soil zone and it takes time for the water to seep through there and then you can see all those uh, darker colors on the figure there, those are all clay lenses. So when the water hits those, it has to either make its way through those or make its way around those. And then we have some larger clay lenses. So there's that lens, that large uh, clay bed that we're calling the Corcoran clay on that map. And that, that is um, in some places impermeable to water. It would take thousands of years for the water to get through there. And then, um, you know, after it's made its way all the way through there, it's gotten down to the confined aquifer where a lot of our wells are pumping from. So that's just kind of the challenge with uh, you know, getting the surface water down you know, to recharge the groundwater system. So next slide, please. All right, so I know all of you, like I said, you're with the other talks, you're you we're talking about current conditions, but unfortunately with groundwater, um, it's really difficult to tell you what the current conditions are because like I said, you know, you can go outside and look at Lake Mead or look at any of the big reservoirs, but we don't necessarily have a way to just go outside and look at the groundwater system. So the way we do that is we essentially drill observation wells. So that figure on the bottom left there is showing the long-term observation well that we have um, in the middle of the Central Valley. And you can see how the groundwater levels respond to wet periods and dry periods there. So for instance, if you look at, um, you know, 97 in that figure, I know it's a little bit hard it's a little small on the screen, but you can see a good recovery and you can also see a good recovery in 83. And then you can also see a response to like the 92 drought. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of these sites, you know, it takes the data, the, the sites that we are collecting data on now, the data is still provisional. And it usually takes us about six months or a year to go through the data and approve it before, um, you know, we're comfortable releasing it and sharing it with people. We do on our water.usgs.gov webpage have some of the provisional data posted. Um, so I'd welcome everyone, if you're interested, to go there and look and kind of see what's happened. We have definitely seen uh, groundwater levels increase in several wells, but, you know, other wells, like I said, we haven't gotten our data back yet because our well might be underwater or, you know, the wells that we don't have continuous loggers on, we have to go out and sample them. And a lot of times, especially with the flood conditions, we can't get out to the wells right now because the roads are flooded. So, you know, it takes time for us to get this groundwater level data co collected. And then even after we've collected this groundwater level data, this is, like I said, just one point in time. It doesn't necessarily tell us um, what's going on in the entire basin. So in order to figure out what's going on, like on a long, in the large scale and convert those groundwater levels into an actual like volume of water, we usually use simulations. So that graph on the right is showing a simulation for the Central Valley. And it has four different lines that are showing storage in the four big basins in the Central Valley. So you can focus on the Tulare Basin there that's the purple line at the bottom. You can see that that basin has, uh, in the last, from 1961 to 2013, uh, the basin has lost almost 100,000 or 100 million acre feet of water. And you can see again, if you look at like the 97 wet period, you can see a recovery and you can see even a recovery in the recent wet period we had in 2001, um, but there's definitely a steady decline. So like like I said in my slide a few, or a few slides ago, you know, we're missing almost, uh, you know, 800 million acre feet of water in uh, all of the groundwater basins um, throughout the West because of uh, this groundwater pumping and um, lack of recharge and um, things like that. So I you know I know that's probably uh, you know not where you're all here for. You're looking for me to tell you what current groundwater conditions are, but that's kind of the story. Is that right now we don't necessarily know, and it's going to take us, um, you know, maybe six months to a year to figure out how groundwater levels recovered in response to this storm, and then maybe a few years after that to get all of that data into a model so we can actually calculate the change in volume in the aquifer from all of that after we get our models updated. Um, so we can go next slide. So one thing I did want to focus on too is that even if we recover the groundwater levels, um, the effects of drought can have some permanent effects. So one of those permanent effects is land subsidence. So what land subsidence essentially is, is that once the aquifer gets devolved, the water leaves the aquifer, there can be a permanent compaction of the clay beds within the aquifer. So that map on the right is actually showing parts of California where the land surface has dropped due to compaction. Um, so basically you remove the water from the aquifer, the aquifer compacts and the land surface actually sinks. So you can see two little um, pictures there too. 
I should say little, um, the man on the left, that's Joe Poland. He was a researcher at USGS back in the 1950s and 60s. He's actually six feet tall. And you can see those signs on the pole that represents where land surface was in 1925 versus 1997 when he took that picture. So the land surface in that area has actually dropped 28 feet. And even in recent, uh, one of my other colleagues, Michelle Sneed, is showing some of the more recent signs we've had. And even there we've had, you know, even after, um, you know, all of the groundwater recharge efforts and conjunctive use, we've still had continuous subsidence in some areas. And the, really the problem with the subsidence is that it causes damage to infrastructure and also to the environment. And often the subsidence is taking place in, you know, if you remember that figure I showed a few slides ago, that's taking place really deep in the aquifer. So even if you start recharging water on the surface, it's gonna take time for that water to make its way down to uh, where the subsidence is taking place. To, so we actually have places now where we are still seeing subsidence despite the flooding that we're having. And that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so I just wanted to highlight one specific area where subsidence uh, causes damage from, you know, from this drought is that the Frank Kern Canal, which is a major canal that serves uh, all of the southern Cal or southern uh, Tulare Basin, and essentially the cal capacity has dropped by almost 60 percent. And the reason, the the main reason behind that is because of that land subsidence, because these canals are built with a very uh, steady grade. And when you get the land surface changing on one end of the canal, that means that you have to raise the stage in the canal by more to move the same amount of water through. And eventually you can't raise the stage in the canal anymore. So that picture on the bottom left there is basically showing that the canal crosses over a bridge. And after land subsidence, the there's no longer any freeboard. Um, you know, the, the water's basically up to the bottom of the bridge there because you, and is you and you can't bring any more water through the canal or else you'd flood over the roadway. So what they've actually had to do is they've had to rebuild the entire canal, like a parallel canal next to the original one. And the Bureau of Reclamation was estimating that this, that this work, you know, has cost five, is going to cost $500 million. And I think that estimate was actually from a few years ago. I've heard that it's going to be more like 700 million now with the price of everything being higher after COVID. So um, that's just a kind of an idea of, you know, the, this drought causes some permanent, permanent impacts and can't be recovered just by, you know, a wet period or a flood like we're having right now. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so on this slide, is, so this is kind of the, uh, you know, the, the light at the end of the tunnel. So how can we achieve better recharge? So right now the state of California, and I know other places throughout the West are doing a bunch of managed aquifer recharge, which we abbreviated as MAR. So this isn't really a new thing. You know, we've been doing this for decades, but really in recent years, we've been trying to like really kick the managed aquifer recharge into high gear. So we have a few ways of doing it. Um, Really the best way to do it is to stop groundwater pumping. So even now during the flood period, we've looked at some of the provisional data in groundwater wells. We see that groundwater levels are still dropping. And the reason is because there's people that actually don't have any surface water rights and they don't even have like the infrastructure on their farms to bring surface water in. They're reliant 100% on the groundwater well. So even in like a super wet period like this, where you know most of, most of us are fighting off the effects of flood, there's still people that are pumping the groundwater system. So that's really the number one way to stop um, this groundwater level decline is to increase that surface water use in lieu of groundwater pumping whenever you can. Um, we're definitely looking at areas that have increased local storage. Um, we're every place possible, we're doing artificial recharge, which is either by um, basically spreading water on, you know, any place we can put it on. If you've, if you've driven through uh, Southern California, you see there's you know water on a lot of the farmer's fields right now. There's water in parks. There's all of the canals are full, just sitting there seeping into the groundwater system. And then beyond that, just protecting natural recharge areas. So there's you know natural wetlands uh, that are a source of major recharge. And we wanna make sure that those areas don't get developed or don't get paved over because that's where a lot of our recharge comes from. And then there's also some a little more expensive options, but you know can have a good effect. And one of them is ASR, which is essentially a reverse well where you inject the water into the ground. And the advantage of that is you don't have to go through all of the soil and the clay lenses and the things that I was showing in my original slide, and you can just inject it directly where you're going to pump it from. And then really some of the long-term solutions, you know, are looking at uh, like reservoir reoperations. So you know, creating more space in the reservoirs to capture these these floods and you know, doing groundwater recharge even when you know we're in a drought condition and there's not a lot of water available um just to make that space in the reservoir available if there happens to be a flood and then obviously all of this has uh, some major 
water rights issues that we have to overcome, you know, because even during a flood period, technically, at least in California, and I'm sure throughout the West, everyone has rights to that water, even if it's uh, unwanted flood water. So, um, and then I think I have one more slide. Um, and I just wanted to mention, this is related to the last slide, but uh, there's a program in California called Floodmar. It's um, essentially, it's the kind of the current management strategy that uh, the state has adopted for uh, generating as much groundwater recharge as possible. And essentially they're looking to get water on any type of working land any way possible. So you can see that uh, picture in the bottom left there is they basically have an orchard there that is being flooded when the orchard, during the non-growing season so that um, we can try to achieve as much recharge as possible. And that is all I have on the groundwater system. Again, I know um, this might not be necessarily what you're looking for as far as uh, current status, but I'm hoping that this prompted some important thinking and got people thinking about maybe some possible plans for action. John, thanks so much. Now this is spot on. Actually, this helps us to you know constantly remind ourselves that there's an another part of this very critical water balance equation, and, and groundwater is a source of water for many Western communities when the surface water supplies become scarce, they automatically turn on the pump. So I think it's um, it was very helpful to kind of see what those impacts are and also helpful to know kind of the time it takes to analyze this groundwater information to kind of get a sense for what happened and how the groundwater was able to recover. So thank you for that. We're gonna move on to Paul Miller. Um, as our next speaker, Paul is the service coordination hydrologist at NOAA's National Weather Service Colorado Basin River Forecast Center, where he's been for almost 11 years. Prior to joining the CBRFC, he worked for the Bureau of Reclamation within the Department of Interior in the Boulder Canyon Operations Office, as well as he worked for the USDA. So, Paul, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, and uh, thanks for having us. Ho hopefully you guys can hear me okay. And sorry, my camera is, is being wonky <laughs> today. So um, yeah, uh, Adam, if you wanna go to the next slide, um, I just wanna give us give folks a quick overview of who we are at the CBRFC. We're one of 13 river forecast centers throughout the country. And in the West, our primary role is all about water supply. There's so many, large reservoirs that are managed by um, big users like the Bureau of Reclamation, who's probably our primary stakeholder. Um, but we have stakeholders that span the entire gamut, right? We have recreationalists, we have environmental uh, coordinators, um, hydropower uh, suppliers and, and movers. So lots of people depend on our forecasts and, and we take that uh, pretty seriously. So. Um, feel free to go to our website. There's lots of information there. And, and if you can't find something, let me know because sometimes it's a little bit buried and I'm happy to help you out. Uh, next slide. So since this is a, a Western drought briefing, I figured it'd be also a good idea to advertise our Western water supply page. We um, aggregate all the water supply forecasts throughout the Western US. Uh, from our colleagues at the California Nevada River Forecast Center and the Northwest River Forecast Center, as well as from the Missouri Basin, Arkansas Red River, and West Gulf RFCs, uh, to bring all the forecasts onto one page. So this is a good spot to just get a nice snapshot of how uh, forecast conditions are doing throughout the West. And you can see, especially in California and in the Colorado River Basin, um, our water supply forecasts are well above average this year. Um, we're we're um, forecasting in some areas record uh, water supply volumes throughout the runoff season, which is typically April through July. Um, and you can see that even extends up into the southern portion of the Northwest RFCs area. Uh, next slide. So just kind of hitting up a little bit here, our, our water year precip to date, and this is a, just a, with about a day lag here, you know, we've had so many multiple atmospheric river events that brought all this precipitation into our area, first to California, and then still had enough moisture to contribute significant to our snowpack accumulation over the winter. Um, <clears throat> the plot on the right is from the NRCS and shows the April 1st, which is typically about the time we typically see uh, peak snow water uh, equivalent conditions. And 
many sites were showing record snow water equivalent values for April 1st, and most were well above 150% of average throughout the majority of the upper Colorado River Basin. Um, additionally, colder than normal temperatures across the region really helped to hold that snowpack uh, up at the higher elevations. Typically, I would say we start seeing lower elevation snowpack melt um, in March. And this year, we, um, we didn't see any like melt in March. We saw basically more and more snow accumulation in March. So um, a lot of that, that uh, runoff that we even see in March um, it, it kind of is getting wrapped into this April through July runoff period. Uh, next slide. And, and just sort of to hammer home the point of just how um, um, out of the ordinary this uh, snowpack is, um, this is a plot where we take uh, 104 of the NRCS no tell stations and we kind of group them together to um, show what conditions are like and, and how it compares to normal conditions. And you can see how the median snowpack over that 1991 through 2020 timeframe in purple uh, sort of evolves and develops. Um, and then you can see what happened last year when we had a historically dry January and February where the snowpack was basically a horizontal line of non-accumulation um, last year and, and ended up below average. This year, you, I think the most impressive part about this is, is just how consistent the accumulation was this year. Um, it basically was accumulating through the first week of April. And only recently have we really started to see the melt um, begin in earnest, um, just because we've, we've had a bit of a warm up, but then a little bit of a cool down. And now it seems like we're, we're warming up here and starting to see some of these flows um, make, it, make their way into reservoirs and, and also the flooding that, that tends to accompany that. Uh, next slide. So just kind of going a little bit more in detail on our, our water supply forecast throughout the upper Colorado River Basin, you can see uh, most areas are, are hovering in that 130 to 150 percent of average range. Um, you know, some of our drier areas, <laughs> and I'm using air quotes, sorry about my camera, <laughs> uh, you know, near normal conditions uh, at the lower end in the Gunnison River Basin, 105 percent, um, you know, that's kind of our drier area. Um, kind of in the Gunnison and in the, the eastern part of the upper Colorado head part waters where we are seeing some drier portions that are only at 80 percent of average but those make up a pretty small percentage of our overall area. Um, the, the Great Basin in particular which isn't shown here but on the next slide um, was was just really phenomenal. And our office is located in Salt Lake City, so I had a, a front row seat to see this accumulation going on. Um, and where most of our, our forecasts are well above 200% of normal. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there's, there's flooding going on, especially in parts of the Bear River Basin in Northern Utah. But again, just really um, high forecasts um, throughout the basin. And if you go to our next slide, our most popular forecast is the, the Lake Powell forecast or the unregulated inflow at uh, Glen Canyon Dam. This, this forecast is, is really what drives a lot of the information that you see coming out of reclamation models. And our most recent forecast is showing just about 11 million acre feet um, of unregulated inflow into uh, Lake Powell. Um, with a chance for that to go even higher. But that's 172% of average, 179% of the median. And um, seems like that forecast is kind of steadying out a bit. So, you know, there's still a lot of spring variability. Um, we like to mention that there's a 20% chance that the, forecast, the observed value will fall outside of this forecasted range. Um, because we've had very wet Mays in the past. We've had uh, very wet Junes in the past. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what the weather plays out for the rest of spring here, but a, a very wet year, uh, lots of uh, 
of uh, flow as expected um, down in Glen Canyon. Uh, next slide. And just to wrap up really quickly, um, I just wanted to give a shout out to just the, the current river conditions. And um, if you look kind of in the northern part of Utah, um, portions of the Yampa River Basin, kind of in the northern part of the, the upper Colorado River, um, we're just seeing high flow, much above average flows everywhere, but flooding conditions in particular in these areas um, where the, the red dots are, are kind of showing. But pretty much every point that we forecast for is showing above average flows um, throughout the basin. And then next slide. And I just wanted to give a, a, a quick shout out because I know this is a, is a west wide uh, webinar. So I spoke with my counterpart at the California Nevada uh, River Forecast Center, Brett uh, Witten, and uh, he just wanted to mention that the Southern Sierra is still showing record snowpack uh, throughout this time of year. Um, there are other parts that are starting to fall below average, but just based off of these plots, not much below average. And if you go to the, the next slide and, and my last slide, um, the CNRC is, is showing record um, water supply conditions forecasted over the San Joaquin Valley. Um, and, and Brett mentioned that this is pretty representative of uh, forecasted seasonal runoff uh, around the Southern Sierras. So um, with that, happy to answer any questions and, and thanks for, uh, for having us. Thank you, Paul, for, um, for joining us and for providing this th information. So I'm going to move on to our last presenter for this webinar. And then at that point, we will start taking some questions. I've noticed there are some already some questions in the questions box, so keep them coming. Um, so let me go ahead and move on um, and, ex and introduce next up is Andy Hoyle. Andy is a research meteorologist at the NOAA's Physical Sciences Laboratory in Boulder, Colorado. He researches uh, the processes, predictability, and projections of hydroclimatic extremes that can be used to improve outlooks of fire risk, drought in this case, water availability, and food insecurity. So Andy, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Viva. Thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for all of our listeners for tuning in. So I'll pose the question that everyone's asking. And uh, it's rhetorical in the sense that a single wet year in the West can't be used as a predictor of hydroclimate um, for the next few years, let alone the next 10 to 20. Um, 2022 to 2023 could be a wet interlude in the midst of low precipitation, or it could be the first in many, as co co many copious precipitation years um, in a prolonged period of above average precipitation. So instead in this presentation, what I'll do is I'll place the 2022-2023 precipitation and temperature so far in the context of our 126 year instrumental record with an emphasis on conditions in large um, hydrological catchments in the western US to provide insights into conditions related to water availability and reservoirs. So moving on to the next slide, what I'll do here is I'm going to emphasize three topics in this presentation. Uh, the first is a historical context of western hydroclimate from the perspective of these hydrologic catchments uh, for precipitation and temperature since the late 1800s highlighting the exceptionally wet 20 years spanning 18, 1980 to 1999, and that were followed by the exceptional dry 20 plus years since 2000. Uh, the sequence of the wettest 20 years followed by the driest 20 years is pretty, pretty fascinating, and it really highlights the inherent variability we can see in the West from one year to the next and one decade to the next. I'll also highlight the variability of precipitation that leads to wet interludes in the midst of drought or alternatively dry interludes in the midst of wetness. And then finally, I'll highlight simultaneous um, October to September temperature and precipitation extremes, uh, focusing on the anomalously high temperatures and the presence of drought in the last two decades. Um, this combination of low precipitation and high temperatures has led to a decrease in water resources compared to if we just had a single quantity that was anomalous. So speaking of those compound extremes, that's where I will begin on the next slide. So shown here are temperature and precipitation for 2000 to 2022 compared to 1896 to 1999. To highlight the compound extremes in the recent period, temperatures on the left are shown as absolute departures and on the right precipitation is shown as relative departures. 
Uh, the data used here is um, NCEI, NOAA NCEI's Inclim Grid data set, and the black lines uh, that you can see on these plots are large hydrologic catchments uh, defined by the US Geological Survey. And I'll principally be focusing on the California catchment, which essentially includes all of California, and the Upper Colorado. So warmer temperatures in the last 20 years compared to the prior 100 have been evident across much of the United States, uh, with particular intensity in the West and Southwest. Uh, really the only exception here is the South Central US, which hasn't, has seen much muted warming compared to the rest of the country. Um, temperatures across much of the Southwest were about a degree Celsius, or about two degrees Fahrenheit warmer in the recent two decades compared to the prior 10. Now focusing on the right, large precip deficits in the last 20 years compared to the prior 100 are evident across almost the entire uh, Western United States. The Eastern United States, on the other hand, has seen um, precipitation surpluses, um, almost rivaling the inverse of the magnitude is what we saw in the West. Now, focusing solely on the Southwest, uh, precipitation differences in the recent two decades compared to the prior, uh, one, prior 10 were about 8%. Uh, it's a 16% uh, across much of the Southwest. So then moving on to the next slide here. Uh, in this slide, what I'll do is I'll illustrate the compound precipitation and temperature extremes in California uh, catchment, which is on the left, and on the right, the upper Colorado catchment for October to September using these scatter diagrams of temperature on the vertical axis and precipitation on the horizontal axis. Well, the colors on here indicate uh, the years uh, ranging from 1896 to 2022. Uh, a really a notable feature of the scatter diagrams is that October to September precipitation and temperature are not closely related in California, whereas they are in the upper Colorado catchment. Um, however, both catchments have observed a notable warming from 1896 to the present, as indicated by higher temperatures in the most recent years indicated by the red dots. So the warming here has led to a combination of high temperatures amid the low precipitation that we have observed over the last 20 plus years. So moving on to this next slide. So the big question here is, how did the precipitation from October to 2022 to March 2023 improve precipitation deficits from the prior 23 years in the West? And as you can see here, the answer is somewhat. On the left, you see precipitation deficits, which include 2000 to 2023, and that's compared to the right, where we see precipitation deficits for 2000 to 2022. What I've done here for um, October to September of 22, 23, is to assume average precipitation for April through September, because that data is not yet available. Uh, precipitation deficits in the most affected areas in the southwest, and this includes California and the upper Colorado and lower Colorado basins, are about 4 to 8 percent less severe in 2022-2023, when 2022-2023 is included, compared to when it isn't on the right. Um, the recent years made a noticeable improvement in the melted decadal precipitation deficit since 2000, but many more years of above average precipitation would be necessary to completely eradicate all of these precipitation accumulated deficits in the last 20, 22 years. On the next slide, what I'm going to do is to place using time series on the right, I'll place 2022-2023 water year in California and upper Colorado catchments into historical context since the late 1890s. The horizontal shading indicates precipitation percentile ranks for the entire period of record. What I've done here is to place with a purple star what 2022-2023 looks like. And what it does is it falls into the top 10 percentile in the California catchment and near the top 10 percentile in the upper Colorado. Uh, compared to precipitation in the last 23 years, 2022-2023 ranks second behind 1617 in California and second behind 2005 in the upper Colorado. Uh, so the time series of October to September precipitation in both California and upper Colorado are very involved. You can see large variations on annual, decadal, and multi-decadal time scales. So just focusing on California on the left, the dry epochs include the 1910s, 1930s, and since 2000, and the wet epochs include 1980 and 1990s. So within these epochs, generally below average or above average precipitation prevails, but we do see individual years that stand out that contrast the overall behavior within that multi-decadal stretch. So for example, the late 1980s saw years of below average precipitation amid multi-decadal wetness, whereas 16 and 17 stands out amid low precipitation since 2000. 
Just focusing briefly on the Upper Colorado, some of the same features are present in its precipitation time series. The 1920s and 30s were quite wet, as well as the 1990s and the most recent two decades quite dry. So on the next slide, what I want to do is I want to further illustrate wet interludes uh, within a, the time of multi-decadal wetness, and by contrast, dry interludes in time of multi-decadal dryness. So what I've done here is to show precipitation for each year since 2000, but ranked from least to most on the horizontal axis. And once again, what we've put here is percentile ranks for the entire period of record shown in colors. This is relative to 1896 to 2022. What's noteworthy here is the frequency of low precipitation in both catchments and just a few copious precipitation years. So what I'll ask Adam, our slide advancer, to do is to toggle back and forth between this slide and the following slide a couple of times, because I just want to show and compare what the 1980s to 1990s look like compared to today. So if you can go back and forth a couple of times, Adam, you can see very large jumps in the precipitation statistics between the two time periods, the 1980 to 1999 time period in both hydrologic catchments, California, Colorado, exceptionally, you can see a very big jump. But you can also see within that, these precipitation interludes that kind of contrast the multi-decadal behavior within that decade. So it's really fascinating to see the differences in precipitation statistics over a variety of decades. Now, we can move on here to the final slide. And what I'm gonna do here is to wrap up by building on what Dave DeWitt had presented uh, earlier concerning the relationship between the El Nino Southern Oscillation and precipitation in the California and Upper Colorado hydrologic catchments. Shown here are scatter plots of the Nino 3.4 index, a measure of the El Nino Southern Oscillation in which higher values mean El Nino and lower values mean La Nina, and precipitation, also indicated in shading over the years. So the outstanding feature here, and I'm sure many in our audience know this, is that there's no systematic relationship between ENSO and precipitation in either hydrologic catchment. Because just looking at this, the scatter diagram is a scatter shot to spread all across the map. But upon closer look, the strong El Nino events in which the Nino 3.4 index departure from average exceeds 1 to 1.5 degrees Celsius, they're related to above average precipitation in, in both catchments. So this feature is important as we look forward to the 23-24 wet season in the West, that's next year, given the El Nino forecast. So this is where I'll finish. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, Andy. Um, fascinating, great analysis. All right, well, with that, I would like to um, give a big thank you to all of our speakers today for their um, very valuable, um, informative and insightful presentations, I'm sure. It, they have generated quite a bit of questioning um, going on in the chat box. Um, so one more reminder to please use the questions box in the GoToWebinar and type your first name and your affiliation and then your question. Um, so I'm going to pivot to the chat box right now. All right, here we go. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask the first question. Uh, for all this, this question is actually for all of the speakers um, or for any one of them specifically that would like to take a shot at answering it. As we wait to see the outcomes of this wet for most of the winter and turn to summer, are there any analog years or similar past, uh, similar past to this one? I'm sorry, let me reread that question. Are there any analog years or similar past to this one? Or are we in, in uncharted territory, either regarding snowpack or groundwater potential or shifting to warm, dry, and what that may mean? So I'm going to uh, invite any or all of our speakers to turn their cameras on if you um, so choose. But if anybody wants to take a first stab at reading the question, um, Joe, I'm gonna, I see you first. Did you want to take a, a stab at this question? Or Andy? <laughs> I'll defer to Andy because I think I was going to point to Andy's graphs to answer it. Oh, okay, great. Andy, do you want to go ahead and, and take a run at it? Yeah, I'll, I'll provide a cautionary tale first. Um, and I, I think a main thread in the presentation that I just gave was the variability in the West, right? From one year to the next, one decade to the next. We're also in uncharted territory too regarding temperatures as well. 
So analog years from the past, where we may have seen some big swings from year to year, decade to decade, may not be that relevant to today, given the land surface behaviors, given the temperatures, and so on and so forth. So yeah, we could go back in our time series and find an analog for precipitation, but it depends a little bit on what your, the lens you're looking through is. Are you more interested in the land surface hydrology? Are you more interested in reservoirs, groundwater? We saw a great presentation on that. So I would say, yeah, we probably need a little bit more information, but use it as a cautionary tale because sometimes analogs may not be that appropriate from the past. Anything you want to add, Joe, before I turn to a question that is for you, Joe? Okay, then let me go ahead and sh sh give you a question. Um, can you explain, Joe, why most of California is no longer in drought? Um, this is a, a question regarding your U.S. drought monitor slide. Yet it seems to contradict that one year of above average precipitation does not completely ameliorate drought. Yes, that's that's right. It it in terms of the drought monitor, we we tend to be looking at conditions. I think at the longest time scale are about five years, and so um, what that is depicting is is kind of what's happened in the last several years with kind of an emphasis more on probably the last, uh, let's say six to 18 months. So on that kind of time frame, we don't qualify for the, uh, the uh, different drought classifications uh, for most of California. However, when we think about something like Lake Mead or Lake Powell, that's actually integrating hydroclimate over decades, even much longer than five years. And so in those cases, I think we still talk about kind of long-term deficits. And, and again, I think I'll point to Andy's presentation. When you look kind of over that 20 year period, you know, what the amount of deficits that we've accumulated, um, we're not gonna get rid of with just one year. Whereas if we just looked at a four or five year period, we, we can put a bigger dent in a relative sense in those. Um, and then there are other places. I, I also wanna make sure that we don't forget, uh, like in Oregon, or in parts of eastern Colorado, eastern New Mexico, that actually did not get that rainfall that we saw in California. So those places that still pop up on the drought monitor, they're they're kind of either drought has emerged there or it, we're kind of having a continuing multi-year event there. Thanks, Joe. I would say that that particular question that I lobbed to you is probably one of the most common questions that is being asked right now, which is how these different products are communicating what would seem to be contradictions, but in fact may not be because they are designed to look at very specific snapshots in time. But I do think it's worth highlighting the fact that this continues to be a source of confusion for folks and it's a most likely a, a significant communication issue. All right, for Dave DeWitt, I've got a question for you. I um, invite you to turn on your camera if you'd like, but here's the question. Can you comment on what happened with this year's forecast and what we thought the outlook was given La Nina. Sure, happy to do that. And so um, there are different modes of climate variability. The, the dominant mode of seasonal to interannual climate variability is El Nino, La Nina. La Nina conditions tend to favor enhanced probability of below normal precipitation for that Southern tier of the US um, and including a large part of California and that whole Southwest region, um, Arizona, New Mexico. Uh, but there are subseasonal modes of climate variability and the largest subseasonal mode of climate variability is called the Madden-Julian oscillation. So this year we had a very active Madden-Julian oscillation. The Madden-Julian oscillation is frequently associated with above normal precipitation in that same region of the Southwest US. And what happened is that the impact from the Madden-Julian oscillation was much larger than the impact from the La Nina conditions. Now, unfortunately, we cannot at present, and we, I mean the global community, because other countries also produce these sort of forecasts, um, and everyone's forecast is basically the same, you can't predict the Madden-Julian oscillation beyond two to four week period, depending upon what metric you're looking at and so in fact the meeting i'm at right now which is a climate services meeting one of the messages that i have emphasized is we need to be able if we can 
try to extend that predictive skill of the Madden-Julian oscillation, uh, or it's going to be an active Madden-Julian oscillation year by SNOT, because being able to do that would be very beneficial for our uh, seasonal precipitation forecast for the Southwest U.S. Hopefully that answers your question. It does. Thank you. I have another one for you um, that kind of falls in the same in same line. What are and actually you kind of already answered this, but I'll give you another shot in case you, there's something you want to add. What are other sources of predictability other than ENSO for seasonal prediction? Anything you want to add? Yeah. You did cover this. Yeah, yeah. And so and I think that that's the the important point is that um, rather than just looking at that seasonal variability, we have to look at that sub seasonal variability. So. Another phenomenon that's very important for U.S. climate, especially in the winter, is uh, sudden stratospheric warming. And again, unfortunately, with respect to that phenomena, right now we can only predict that two weeks, three weeks in advance. So that's a place where also if we increase the predictability of that sub-seasonal phenomena, that we would actually be able to improve the seasonal forecast skill. Great, thanks so much. All right, you're off the hook for a little bit here. I'm going to pivot over to uh, to John. I have a couple. I have a few questions for you. So join um, the cam. If you, I think your camera wasn't working. So first question for you, John. Right there you are. Hello. Are there any ASR projects happening right now? Can you give us a sense of how expensive they are, and what are the ecological slash climate implications with these projects? Okay, yeah. So multi-part question. Um, yes. So yes, there's definitely um, a lot of ASR projects going on right now. Um, generally, they're done more in uh, like urban areas where the cost of land is a lot higher because the footprint of an ASR to get the same amount of water in the ground is a lot less. Um, so I know, for instance, like I live in Northern California and just in the city of Roseville near where I live, they're putting in a good amount of ASR. Um, the cost, you know, again, I'm going to give kind of a washy answer, but um, you know, it depends on how deep you need to go and um, exactly how much, but usually it's in the tens to hundreds of million dollar range to put in an ASR well. Um, and then what was the third part of the question was? Uh, third, the third part of the question was, what are the ecological slash climate implications with these projects? Um, so I don't know if by ecological, so, so I guess one of the one of the issues is there's obviously a water quality issue concern because you're going to be injecting water from a different source than the water that is going to be in the aquifer that you're injecting into in a lot of cases. Um, so you do have you do have issues where um, you can get you know some type of chemistry going on when you say inject like a, a basic water into a into a water you know an, an older water that was below. Um, but as far as the uh, you know the dry don't the drought implications, it's, um, you, you'd have to do a lot of these projects in order to make a big dent is kind of, you know, the, and that's been kind of my story all along is that, uh, you know, it's, we're not going to solve the groundwater um, decline with just one or two projects, you know, it has to be, a, a you know, on, on a, a massive scale with everyone pitching in and doing their part in their area of the groundwater basin in order to, you know, see significant recoveries. Thanks for that. I have another question from you. Um, sure. The next one here is, are there any injection wells that are in use for aquifer recharge? Is that a feasible investment that could be made for future large storm events that cause flooding? Yeah, so I think I kind of just answered that. So ASR is, is basically injection wells. Um, and it's definitely one of the solutions, but like I said, it's not, it's not gonna be the best solution in all areas, you know, especially like I said, in areas where you have, um, you know, cheaper land to buy. You know, some of the other solutions might be you better. Um, and then, like I said in my talk, you know, even if you can try to protect those natural recharge areas and not develop in them in the first place, that's really going to be the most cost-effective way to achieve effective recharge. All right, and I lied. Um, I do have a follow-up <laughs> here that was just shared sure. with me. So you shared, let me just make sure that I'm not being redundant here. You shared how groundwater impacts infrastructure. We talked about subsidence, but a question came in, how is groundwater affected by infrastructure? Well, everything is uh, everything's connected. So for instance, like the Frank Kern Canal that I showed, you know, if capacity is reduced to the Frank Kern Canal, people aren't going to be getting their deliveries and they're going to be then turning to groundwater pumping in order to meet their demands. Um, that's especially true for uh, 
some of the new agriculture that we're putting in in the Southern California or in the, the or in the Southern Central Valley, you know, the vineyards and the orchards, when they, you know, when they go in, their farmers, you know, have a cost suck into putting those trees in the ground. So they're going to be willing to pay a lot more for water, even if that means, uh, you know, pumping when it might be more expensive than the service water delivery that they would have gotten, but they now can't get because the infrastructure was damaged. Okay, thank you. I'm going to, to get you off the hook for a bit and pivot to Paul Miller. Paul, I have a few questions for you, so feel free if your camera's working to turn it on. First up, Paul, is there a concern with increased dust on snow that may increase the rate of melt of the large snowpack in the West this spring slash early summer? Thanks, and um, yeah, sorry, my, my camera's just, just wonky today. I don't know why. It's okay. <laughs> um, but uh, no, that that's a really good question. And, um, you know, we've done a lot of research looking at the impacts of dust on snow and we're able to, um, I won't get into the, the super technical details, but we're able to ingest that information from the, the NASA MODIS satellites to adjust our forecast to account for it. And it does help us with the timing of the runoff um, that we see. That, that being said, um, this year we haven't seen as much impacts from dust, um, at least for the areas that we forecast um, for. Um, but we have seen years in, in the past that have been heavily impacted by, by um, uh, dust impacts uh, affecting the albedo on the snow. So um, this year we haven't seen, seen those impacts. It, it seems to be more driven by the amount of snow and, and the cooler temperatures that we've been seeing. Um, and plus we, we've had a lot of cloudy days. Um, which um, which has impacted things as well. So this year it hasn't been as impactful. Um, but that being said, it's still an area of, of continued research. Uh, folks are still looking at this information quite a bit, um, and and we're going to continue to bring this information and incorporate it into our forecast. Great, thanks for that. Another question for you, a little bit on different topics. I'll pivot here. How many winters like this one do you think? are necessary to start to help fill the deficit created by this 20 plus year drought? This is another frequently asked question. And if you've got the answer, we're all ears. But yeah, what's your perspective on this kind of question about how many winters like this one is it gonna take to get out of this 20 plus year deficit and drought? Sure, and, and I'll start off by saying that um, Jennifer Pitt, who's the director of the National Audubon Society, um, she had a really great way of, um, of, of kind of restating this, this question. And um, she gave an interview where if, if we had normal snowpack conditions for three consecutive years and absolutely zero water use, we would refill um, the majority of, of the reservoirs of the Upper Colorado River Basin. So kind of using that same logic and, and knowing that we're about 180% of average and knowing that we're not ever going to not use water <laughs> in any given year, you can kind of get a rough estimate that it would take six to eight years of this kind of year consecutively, um, which probably isn't very likely, um, to refill the reservoirs in the in the upper Colorado River Basin. And I think that kind of includes Lake Mead as well. In the lower. Okay, and that's and that also, you know, when we need to consider the, uh, the infrastructure impacts to the, the type of precipitation that we have. And, you know, if, it, if we end up having these large flooding events, that has its own set of um, uh, unintended consequences from having these, you know, six years of, you know, above average snowpack. So, Lots of things for utilities and water managers to consider um, when when we look at the answer to this question. Thanks, um, Paul. I'm going to uh, give you a break for a minute here or so, and I'm going to pivot to Andy. So, Andy, if you want to turn on your camera, let me pose a question to you. In the context of the multi-decadal scale drought, will the antecedent conditions of dry soils and high evaporative loss return quickly? 
how long do you think the benefits of this wet year will be sustained? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, the antecedent conditions in terms of soil moisture play a huge role because you can melt your snow and it runs off, but it depends on how much gets absorbed in the soils and increases the soil moisture as opposed to actually getting down in the reservoirs. So that is, that's an active area of research about how that is going on, the processes there in a warming climate, and not just in a warming climate like right now, but sustained for like 10, 20 years in the future. Um, I just wanted to comment on the, on the prior question. It really depends on what your target metric is for drought. Are you interested in your reservoir levels? Are you interested in stream flows, groundwater, so on and so forth? And the way you kind of approach the problem and the way you perceive the physical science is kind of different. It's relevant uh, to each, each facet. So like in terms of soil moisture right now, things are all copacetic. They're great. You know, the, the, the snow's going to run off. The snow's going to melt. It's going to run off. It's going to um, replenish the, the soil moisture and help the ecology. But it'll take longer for the reservoirs to recharge. And you need that, that sustained behavior over many years. You know, we need to go into sort of a wet regime to really help to fill up those reservoirs. And yeah, I think the back of the envelope calculations that people have thrown out here in our presentation today are, are realistic. Thanks for that. And I, I really appreciate you um, kind of focus, having us focus on, it, it, it does depend when we ask this question. It's probably in, uh, important when we attempt to answer to kind of provide those caveats um, that it's not a one size fits all answer. So, for, so thanks for raising that point clearly. Um, all right, Paul, I'm coming back to you here with another question. Um, this person is asking, I'm curious whether the forecast centers are seeing interest by local water users in using near-term streamflow forecasts to support opportunistic capture of high flows for managed aquifer storage infiltration. Sure. Um, I, I guess what I'll say is um, we there's not a lot of aquifer storage, dedicated aquifer storage space um, throughout the upper Colorado River Basin. It, it does happen a lot in the lower Colorado River Basin. Um, and But that being said, um, a lot of the resource managers, and, the, and, and that includes the, the water resource managers, they do look at our short-term forecasts um, as well as our, our seasonal forecasts. And they are making decisions every day and changing their operations every day in response to our forecasts and, and, and other impacts um, to, um, to more efficiently manage uh, resources, whether that's coordinating with diverters to, to move water um, and, and even store water in, in diversion canals um, or, or take advantage and, and, and uh, store as much water as possible in the reservoir system um, that we currently have. So um, I guess the short answer is yes, but it, it's not just the aquifer storage. It's it's lots of different things that, that go into the, the resource management. Great, thank you so much. All right, I wanna be cognizant of the time. Um, we do have time for another question. So um, the, this one here, I'm gonna to pose to everybody on the, uh, on the presentation dais um, and invite you all to, to, to attempt or to weigh in on the answer to this question. We have definitely the time to hear from all of you or, or a good bit of you. So here is the question. In the West, public agency communications around drought seem to skew towards emergency situations and how to manage acute drought events. Do you see a change in how science teams in public agencies talk about living with drought as a more persistent fact of life in the West? Are there any recent examples or approaches you've seen or used to effectively talk about data like presented here to promote more awareness of long-term and, and a more long-term drought planning mindset. So if I need to read that again, um, uh, is there anybody who without me reading again has, has got some thoughts on this question? 
and, and this is just let me say this is something that we are seeing very clearly in the west especially within the colorado river basin where you have lots of people starting to ask the question are we really are we really talking about planning for a drought are we talking about kind of a permanent state of affairs or a permanent state in the climate that is shifting to more aridity more desert like um, and, and this is where we talked about the need for communications uh, strategy that is very um, clear on the distinction between these two things and is able to communicate them in, in, in a way that helps people to manage their resources better. Um, so anybody on this, any of the presenters want to take a stab at, at this idea of, you know, not skewing towards emergency management, looking at whether or not there's a better way to, um, to get people to to communicate about kind of more of the long-term changes that are happening, as opposed to thinking about this as an extreme event that has a clear end to it. Yeah, I, I can jump in. I mean, I, I think one of the, I, I think things are changing and I think part of it is is the lexicon and I would say the word aridification, you know, that, that word is much more common both in scientific discussions as well as in, in kind of the, the um, public discourse around around the Colorado River Basin in California. And I would say, I would be careful though, to not take the West monolithically, because that may not actually apply to the Northwest, right? That may not apply to every part of all the states we've been looking yes. at. But I do think for the Southwest in California, you've seen that emerge. And I think we've identified aspects of aridification, of long-term aridification on the research side. And we're trying you know, to communicate that that said, I think the challenge is not, I mean, there is a communication challenge, but I think the biggest issue is that we don't manage a lot of natural resources on the timescales that we're facing the challenge of, right? Multi-decadal planning is very hard. We are much better or have devoted many more resources to emergency response and recovery for good reason. But right. we lack, I think, in that kind of adaptation space, um, the authorities and the resources that I think, uh, are there so we could communicate it a lot you know from a science standpoint but it, are there receptors and i think that's the part that i'm hoping um we can improve our communication at the same time that many of these public agencies can have more resources and capacity to think about the long-term implications of something like drought but there are other issues it's not the only one right long-term yeah. fires long-term flooding there all these environmental changes have some largely driven by climate change have some really long, long-term, um, you know, time horizons, and okay. and our ability to kind of make decisions on those time horizons is is still emerging or still kind of in its early stages, in my opinion. Thanks, Joe. Andy, you still have your camera on. Does that mean that you would like to add to that um, <laughs> to that response, or uh, I don't want to call you out on anything, but yeah. No, it's fine. Yeah, I didn't want to be awkward and turn it off, turn it back on, turn it off. Okay. It off. I, right. I figured I'd just keep it on. Um, okay. I'll speak for sort of the drought community and the way we're looking at things. We're looking at things more regionally as opposed to more large scale, just because the impacts tend to be pretty local and pretty regional. And also trying to separate what is natural, what is variability from that of aridification. What's the climate change component? What is the variability component? and how can we separate them physically, but also in terms of what that means for downstream effects. And the last 20 years have been a pretty fascinating case study for us because the one of the maps I showed is basically wetness from the middle of the country east and dryness to the west. And you're like, well, gee, how much of that is natural versus anthropogenic and what are the impacts? So the impacts in the Midwest have actually been increased flooding. And we've talked about this in a variety of forums here. So how much of that is the climate change component? How much of that's variability? And I think we have a lot to learn about our climate system, about how to guide that. Uh, our science, we've been doing it for quite a while, but we still know relatively little, and there's much more that we can learn to be able to put to good use. Thank you, Andy, thank you. Well, this is the time. Oh, John, did you want to make a comment here yeah. or add to this? I yes, to, please I guess from the groundwater point of view, um, I think one of the so so emergency groundwater recharge doesn't work basically because you know you're having you know millions and millions of acre feet flow by, and you might have like that ASR well that only can recharge like ten thousand acre feet. So, really, from the groundwater point of view, responding to drought like 
ground recharge needs to be a constant thing and not just something that you do during the emergencies. So, um, and it needs to be something that happens all the time, even when it's not wet. And that could mean in a dry period that you release extra water from the reservoir, even though the reservoir is already low so that you get that recharge happening. And I don't know, that just kind of needs a shift of thinking from everybody because if you know, people don't like to go outside and see empty reservoirs, they think that, you know, that's a problem, but you know, that you have to almost look at that empty reservoir as an opportunity that when the next flood comes, that's extra space that you can capture additional water that you wouldn't have otherwise if you didn't divert that water and do some groundwater recharge um, during a non-emergency situation. Thank you for that, John. All right, well, we are at the bottom of the hour here, and I want to, again, extend a very big thank you to everyone who shared their time, their expertise with us today, very generous with your time and expertise. Uh, as I close out, I wanna just call everybody's attention to the chat box. We have actually put some additional links in there, some information that you may wanna take a quick look at before you sign off. Uh, again, thank you to everyone who worked behind the scenes to make this webinar happen. A lot of folks, not just from the NIDAS team, but from our partners, which we couldn't have done this without them. We will, as a reminder, provide a summary of this webinar with resources discussed today on the webinar summary page at drought.gov backslash webinars. And with that, I would like to say a big thank you to you all for joining us today. And that now officially concludes today's webinar. Thank you again and have a great day.